In his 195th start, driving for his fourth NASCAR Cup Series team, Daniel Suarez becomes a NASCAR Cup Series winner. How's it going y'all? My name is Eric. Welcome to Out of the Groove Sonoma Race Review Edition. The race and post-race celebration just wrapped up. Well, actually, I'm sure the celebration will be going well into the evening, but what a feel-good ending to this race. We're gonna talk about the finish. We'll talk about the winner. We've got lots to unpack today. This was the second road course race of the Cup Series season. It was also Fox's last race of their portion of the broadcast schedule. Last race before the one and only bye week this season. There's a lot. We'll react to some of the highlights in a moment, we'll talk about the top finishers, put this thing on the groovy gauge at the end, but I do want to begin by talking about the winner, Daniel Suarez. And I want to start with Daniel himself. That Xfinity Series championship he won back in 2016 feels like a lifetime ago. He wasn't the best Joe Gibbs Racing driver that season, but he won a few races. He was there at Homestead at the end and took advantage of a late race restart to get that championship. Everyone expecting him to spend another year or two at least in the Xfinity Series contending for more championships for Joe Gibbs Racing, when suddenly he was thrust into the NASCAR Cup Series for the 2017 season following Carl Edwards' sudden retirement. Suarez was not ready for the Cup Series and did not perform as well as his Joe Gibbs Racing teammates in either 2017 or 2018, which resulted in him getting booted for Martin Truex Jr. He landed with Stuart Haas Racing for one season. Results weren't much better. And suddenly for 2020, Daniel Suarez was driving for Gaunt Brothers Racing in the 96. His NASCAR career was hanging by a thread. But one thing about Daniel Suarez never really changed. Anyone who's ever met Daniel Suarez, whether if you're a fan, if you're an industry member, a team member, a media member, whomever, you likely have nothing but good things to say about your encounter with Daniel Suarez. He is genuinely one of the nicest, most engaged drivers in the garage. I've been fortunate to have him on the show actually a couple of times and he has been one of my favorite interviews, one of my favorite conversations I've had with any sort of driver in NASCAR. It's hard not to like Daniel Suarez. And we talk often about relationships in the sport and how certain drivers burn bridges or make enemies at bad points in the season. Suarez has ruffled some feathers here and there, sure, see Michael McDowell, but he has consistently been one of the most likable guys in the garage. He was able to combine that likability with some of the corporate sponsorship he's attracted to help start Trackhouse before the 2021 season. For the first time in his NASCAR Cup Series career, Daniel Suarez was the guy for a semi-competitive NASCAR Cup Series team. And now, a year and a half into Trackhouse's existence, Daniel Suarez has brought them to victory lane. Of course, this is Trackhouse's third win of the season. The new guy, Ross Chastain, has already won twice this year. But Daniel Suarez has been oh so close a couple of times this year. He dominated the first portion of the Circuit of the Americas race, led the first 15 laps, won the first stage, and then steering problems took him out of contention. Whether it's been parts breaking, bad pit stops, or in some cases, like Charlotte a couple weeks ago, driver error, Suarez has been unable to capitalize on many Many of his strong runs this year. That is, until today, Daniel Suarez wins it at Sonoma, dominates the entire second half of this race, celebrates with a taco pinata on pit road, his entire team, and I mean team, not just the pit crew, not just the road crew, but the crew chief, the team owner, PR reps were there. Everyone from Trackhouse, everyone affiliated with Daniel Suarez. Heck, I'm, I think if he could have, he would have brought Daniel's amigos, all the folks up in the crowd, he would have brought them down onto the front stretch with him. A well-deserved victory and an earned celebration again, Suarez, just a couple of years ago, was practically hung out to dry, but he was able to leverage his good relationships with sponsors and with other members of the industry into an opportunity at Trackhouse, which I'd say has panned out, especially this year. A great example of how it still sometimes pays to be the nice guy in the NASCAR Cup Series. Anyway, I do want to pivot slightly off of Daniel Suarez for a moment, but Trackhouse Racing continues to be the most impressive team in the Cup Series this year. Chastain's two victories tied for the series lead. Now Daniel Suarez has a win, which, by the way, blows up the playoff grid. Suarez has had some speed this year, but again, very inconsistent when it comes to finishing races. He was outside, I think he was like 20th, 21st in points coming into today. I don't remember off the top of my head. This win vaults him into the playoffs, and with like, what, 10 races to go, good chance this win locks him in. I know I was critical of some of Justin Marks' comments this past week. He was defending his driver, Ross Chastain, but in some cases I thought was going a little over the top with it. I give Marks credit for this. He is consistent. No matter if it's Ross Chastain or Daniel Suarez, he is all in, 100% behind his drivers. 
He fully bought into and believed in Daniel Suarez from day one, never showed any signs of wavering. This year, it's been the same story with Ross Chastain, and now both drivers have finally reached, I'd say, close to, if not, their full potential. Daniel Suarez has never received this kind of focused support in his entire NASCAR Cup Series career. Back when he was with Joe Gibbs Racing, you know, as a rookie filling in for Carl Edwards, he was not the focus of that team. He was the fourth wheel, if you will. Same thing at SHR. He wasn't the most talented driver there and wasn't getting the most focus. At Trackhouse, he has full confidence from Justin Marks, 24-7, 365, and I do think that makes a difference. We have to give Justin Marks, Ty Norris, Pitbull, all of Trackhouse, some serious props for that. Now I do want to talk about the top finishers because Daniel Suarez was not the only standout performer today. Chris Buescher driving the 17 for RFK finishes second. His best finish of the season. I never thought I'd see the day that the Roush 17 was actually good at Sonoma coming from a long time at Kenza fan, but Chris Buescher was genuinely fast today. He was one of the few drivers who could keep pace with Kyle Larson and Chase Elliott in the first half of this race. And he was the only driver who could somewhat keep pace with Daniel Suarez in the second half of this race. He was just this close to taking that lead pretty much all day long. So it has to be frustrating to come this close to, to winning. And Chris Buescher in a very similar situation as Daniel Suarez coming into this. Not in a position really to point his way into the playoffs. Needs a win. This may be the best shot Chris Buescher gets all season long. There are three more road courses before the playoffs and two more super speedways, so there are other opportunities, but boy, second place on the final restart at Sonoma with one of the best cars. Man, opportunities don't get much better than this one. Still, a lot of credit to Chris Buescher. They joked about this sort of on the Fox broadcast, but two weeks ago, he was flipped upside down. Last week, missed due to COVID. He comes back and runs, quite frankly, the best race of his career, I'd say, from start to finish. Chris Buescher second, Michael McDowell finishes third. That final restart, I don't remember how many laps there were left, but I looked at the first couple rows and I said, oh my gosh, between Suarez, Buescher, McDowell, Harvick was in the mix, and at one point Brad Keselowski was up in the top five. The entire top five was full of drivers capable of blowing up the playoff grid, and Michael McDowell was chief among them. Great road course racer, we know that. He comes from a road racing background, qualified well, ran in the top 10 all day long, and earned a legit top five. Michael McDowell statistically is having the best year of his Cup Series career. I know last year winning the Daytona 500 trumps everything, but this year, if we look at the entirety of this, these first 16 races, Michael McDowell is putting together a remarkable statistical season, considering he's in front row motorsports equipment. And he predicted this, remember eight months ago or so when it wasn't clear if he was gonna come back next year? He said, hey, if I get a chance to drive that next gen car, it races kinda like a sports car, I'll be competitive. He's delivered on that promise. He has been very competitive this year. I just mentioned it, but Kevin Harvick also gets a top five, a much needed kind of shot in the arm for Kevin Harvick, the driver. Unfortunately, it was the pit crew that kind of let him down. He had a real shot at contending with Chris Buescher and Daniel Suarez before the final caution, at least. When his pit crew had a very slow pit stop, he came in literally right next to Chris Buescher. Buescher left and Harvick sat there. I think they had to jack up the car a second time. I don't know exactly what the problem was, but a slow pit stop cost Harvick some spots. He rebounded to fourth. A still really solid day for him. And a good points day because he also collected some stage points. And he came into this race just a few points outside the top 16. Guys like Eric Jones, Tyler Reddick struggled. So a pretty good points day for Kevin Harvick, all things considered. A couple of Penske drivers, Austin Sindrick, we know he's a great road course racer. He proved that in the Xfinity series for several years. He gets a top five and Ryan Blaney. Felt like every time I saw Blaney on screen, someone was trying to use him up, whether it was Hamlin locking up the, the brakes and, and getting into him, or at the end, Sindrick was running into him, his own teammate. <laughs> Ryan Blaney still, solid sixth place run. Ross Chastain had a relatively quiet day, something I think he needed desperately after last week. He gets a solid seventh. I did notice that Tony Stewart at one point during the broadcast was kind of throwing some shade Chastain's way. He was doing it as nicely as I think Tony Stewart can criticize someone. You know, he was acknowledging tons of talent, great driver, but he was criticizing Chastain for, for effectively mirror driving every corner, which <laughs> while we were watching the race, he, he did do that a couple times trying to block Kyle Larson. I only bring that up because I think a lot of fans believe, you know, last week's incidents with Chastain and Hamlin and Chastain and Chase Elliott were isolated incidents. And that's not the case. This is the kind of sentiment that I think is widespread throughout the garage. Ross Chastain is an overaggressive driver. And it's something that's just now starting to boil over where everyone is comfortable saying it. Not just Hamlin, not just Elliot. Tony Stewart's comfortable acknowledging it. I heard on Austin Dillon's radio, he and his team owner Richard Childress were pretty upset with Chastain in this race. Everyone in the garage has thought this for a long, long time, but only recently it seems are people really comfortable saying it. Chase Elliott had a really good car today. He rebounds to finish eighth. 
He had a real good shot at winning this race. His car was, I'd say, at least equal to that of Daniel Suarez and Chris Buescher. But in the second half, they had a disastrous pit stop. He started to leave. They realized the wheel wasn't tight. He had to back up, but he didn't back up all the way. So they ended up hitting him outside the box. Then when the caution came out at the end of stage two, they had to serve that penalty, which meant going all the way to the rear, losing all that track position, dozens and dozens of spots. And at Sonoma, it is not easy to quickly make up positions. There weren't a lot of cautions or restarts in the second half to give him opportunities. So Chase Elliott rebounding for a top 10, all things considered, is, is pretty impressive. And I'm happy Brad Keselowski got a top 10. I think that's his, his first top 10 since literally Daytona in February. So good day for RFK. I do want to mention Kyle Larson real quick, finishing 15th, another driver who sort of rebounded a couple of times. Larson started up front, dominated the first stage of this race, led every lap, won the first stage, elected not to pit early to keep his track position. He fell to the back of the pack in stage two, worked his way back up into about the top 10, ninth or 10th place into stage three, when he also had a disastrous pit stop. Well, actually the pit stop was fine. It was when he left pit road, Right front fell off the car. So Cliff Daniels, crew chief, he's going to miss the next four races. And so will a couple of Kyle Larson's top pit crew members. He still rebounded from that to get a top 15. He had a really good car, similar to that of Chase Elliott's. Although it did sound like as the race went on and he was back in traffic, they were fighting high tire wear. So uh, I don't know that Elliott had as good of a car truly as Chase Elliott or Suarez or Busher, but he would have likely been a contender if they'd elected to keep their track position as opposed to going for the stage win in stage one. Which, side note, we talk about this almost every time there's a road course race now, but I'm tired of stage cautions at road courses. I think many people are. You gotta give out stage points at road courses or else these races become effectively less valuable than every other race on the schedule. But I'd like to see what would happen if they elected not to throw the caution for stage ends. Just award the points as they cross the line and then let them keep racing. I'm not sure if that would fix all the problems and I understand that TV likes having those stage breaks to throw commercials, but gosh, there's enough commercials over green flag racing now, I don't think anyone will notice. I just hate seeing guys run well, dominate the stage, and then have to decide, do I collect the stage points I've rightfully earned? Or do I pit, give up those stage points, but set myself up better to maybe get points in the next stage? Like, I hate that the best drivers have to make that decision. It's dumb. I doubt NASCAR will change anything, especially not this year, but maybe next year. Maybe next year. Let's try. Let's try eliminating the cautions at road courses. So that, that's just a thought. Anyway, real quick, you may have noticed. 15 drivers right here. Not one Toyota driver finished in the top 15. Kurt Busch in 18th was the best finishing Toyota. Today was just a disastrous day for Joe Gibbs Racing for 2311. Bubba Wallace blew a motor early on. Unclear if it was just a fluky deal or if he maybe did something during the weekend to over rev the engine. That's what Tony Stewart was at least hypothesizing. Kyle Busch hated his car all day. Denny Hamlin was running outside the top 20 for a good portion. Martin Truex Jr., who was my pick coming into the weekend. He was reunited with Cole Pern, who was serving as lead engineer this weekend. Sonoma's been one of Truex's, probably Truex's very best track on the schedule. He's got three wins there. And he was a no-show. He qualified 28th. I look up late in stage one, maybe it was early stage two, and he's running 31st. 31st! I know he's got a lot of uncertainty clouding him right now. He's supposed to make a retirement decision in the next few weeks, but I don't know. That doesn't excuse a terrible team performance today. Eric Almarola is in a lame duck season. He's already announced he's retiring and he didn't run very well today, but at least he collected some stage points. <laughs> Martin Truex Jr. should not be this bad on a road course. Now, some of these Joe Gibbs Racing Toyotas caught a break with that late race caution for Larson's wheel falling off, but still faded outside the top 10, and then many of them pit late to try and catch another lucky break with another caution. That, of course, never showed up. So some of them would have finished better than they did, but not by much. <laughs> they were not good today, unfortunately. Chris Bell had problems from like the drop of the green flag. Anyway, those were the top finishers. Let me know how your favorite driver did down in the comment section below. Let's see, we've talked about the top finishers, we've talked about the guys who struggled, we've talked about Daniel Suarez, we've talked about Trackhouse. Let's put this race on the groovy gauge. Sonoma has never been my favorite road course on the schedule. Back in the days when it was just Sonoma and Watkins Glen, I usually looked forward to Watkins Glen way more. Part of that, again, see earlier comment was because my boy Matt Kenseth was terrible at Sonoma. But another part of it was because it just didn't seem to 
consistently produce engaging, close competitive racing. It's a very, very technical track. I'd say it's a more technical track than Watkins Glen, which means if you have your car set up, if you understand the track the best, if you have your shift points down, your braking points down, you can drive away and hide pretty quickly here at Sonoma. So typically a little less passing. That's what we saw here today. It becomes a track position race and the stage cautions throw a whole wrench into that, which is kind of frustrating. Ultimately, the best drivers and cars and the best executing teams found the front late. That's all you can really ask for. Yeah, Suarez ran off, won this race by like four or five seconds, but for a while there, at least Busher was keeping him honest. Suarez had a better long run car than him the run previously, so it was clear once Busher didn't make a move early on, he probably wasn't getting by the 99. That eliminated some of the suspense, but I'll say this. Having watched Daniel Suarez all these years come very, very close to winning or getting great finishes in the past, I was just waiting for something to go wrong in those final few laps. When AJ Allmendinger spun out into the fence with two to go, I about had a heart attack. So there was still a layer of suspense, but it wasn't as, as deep, as dense as I would have liked it to be. Overall, still not a bad, bad race. I'm gonna give it a 60%. It was a little above average. I mean, I love NASCAR, so it's hard for me to give any average race a bad score, but that's really what today was. It was an average race. The mistakes on pit road kept things fresh. It caused new players to emerge up at the front. The drivers were really working the cars. We saw great drivers spin out or, or lock up the brakes routinely. So I'm going to give it a 60%. It was, it was Pretty good race, it was fine, you know, for Sonoma, it was okay, it was kind of what you expect. Leave your thoughts down in the comment section below. What do you think of today's race at Sonoma? We've got an off week now until NBC takes over the schedule at Nashville. I do want to briefly address Fox. I, I thought the broadcast today was fine. Um, Clint Boyer was not there, apparently due to personal reasons. That's the only information Fox gave out. We had Tony Stewart in the booth as expected. Larry McReynolds filled in. I thought the two of them alongside Mike Joy were, were pretty good. I think Tony Stewart, while I've enjoyed some of his insight this year, I think he's just a little too stiff, at least for my liking. Say what you will about Clint Boyer, and I'm not the biggest Clint Boyer TV fan at this point, but he's not stiff, not usually. He's a little too loose sometimes, but overall I thought Stewart and McReynolds were good. I love Larry McReynolds. I've said before, I think my perfect Fox booth, at least for next year, would be Mike Joy leading Larry McReynolds and Jamie McMurray. Because I think McMurray adds a similar level of insight as Tony Stewart, but it's a little, a little looser. Not too loose, but loose enough. It's like I'm describing race cars now. Loose, tight, whatever. <laughs> too many commercials, but yeah, that's not going to change until the next TV deal. I will say there was the one point where I think Cole Custer spun out and the cameras just cut away and nobody ever acknowledged it. A few of those happened this year that were just frustrating. Would hope to see Fox completely revamp their NASCAR coverage next year. That doesn't mean you have to change all the people. I just think you need different ideas. You need a different set of instructions being passed down from the top producers over at Fox Sports. They stopped doing as many of the cringy skits as we got into the summer months, thankfully. Hopefully but more times than not, it just felt like they were going through the motions. Like I hesitate to say that the broadcast felt stale because the inclusion of a different analyst every week actually freshened things up. But too often it feels like they're reading off a script. Everything is the, the Coca-Cola pass of the race, the monster energy move of the day, the Pennzoil pit stop mess up of the day. Like everything's corporate, everything's commercialized. A lot of commercials, especially for the big Fox races. Yeah, I'm gonna stop griping. A lot of these are things that just aren't gonna be changed until 2025, if ever. I, I, but I just want to air those thoughts. NASCAR broadcasts in the modern day need to be modernized. You need to look at Formula One or how NBC handled the Indianapolis 500 a few weeks ago. No full screen commercials over green flag racing. They just did side by sides. Like that's got to be the future of NASCAR TV coverage. It has to happen. Make the budget, make the bottom line work. It has to happen. Anyway, those are my final thoughts. I'm looking forward to NBC's portion of the year. We've got a week off, but that doesn't mean there won't be any stories to cover. So I will see you guys again in a few days. Thanks for watching. If you're new to the channel, hit that subscribe button. We talk NASCAR almost every day here on Out of the Groove. And as always, a big thank you to my Patreon supporters. I couldn't do this show without your tremendous support every single month. Very, very generous of you. I really appreciate it. We will be back later this week. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for hitting that subscribe button, and I'll see you in the next episode.